have only been thinking about this since about October. Um, so the project is in its very rough and ready stages. This is not its, its most polished work. Um, this, a lot of what today's presentation will involve is what we uh, in philosophy would call armchair thinking, right? Um, which means that I've, I've had some research, um, but today's talk is kind of going to be more presenting the idea to you all in the hopes of generating some good discussion um, during the question and answer section so that you, you all's thoughts and uh, contributions can help inform mine. Um, so Twitter trending, um, international hope isn't my handle, actually. Mine is uh, your fave philosopher. Um, so if you, you know, are interested, you can add that during the talk. Um, and the two hashtags we're going to be working with today um, is speaking clarity, right? And then speaking clarity on polyamory, right? For those of you who don't know, my name is Justin Clarity, so it's kind of like a little witty play on the names, right? And, oh, you guys are tough rappers. <laughs> Right, okay, so this is kind of a cool little cartoon. Those people that know me, my man Zach is here. Um, he's in my program. Um, and if you've ever had an outline for me, you know that it's going to come with like a quirky little cartoon, right? We're relevant to what the hell I'm talking about or writing about or whatever, right? Um, and I thought that this cartoon was pretty funny because it captures at least how we sort of sociologically perceive uh, polyam polyam polyamorous practices, right? Cartoon reads, I love your open relationship idea. It's the perfect end to this whole starter relationship idea, right? And I think it kind of really touches on this stigma, right? Um, or what I'm calling this stigma, but at least these sort of sociological pressures that we have um, for monogamous relationships, right? Um, nothing wrong with that, as we'll see kind of uh, as I continue, but I thought this was kind of funny. All right, so I said earlier that um, a lot of what I'm going to have to say kind of depends upon making a distinction between courting and dating. Um, and that's what we'll focus our energy on here. I mean, I think first that our language is way too sloppy when we're talking about these issues, right? Way too sloppy, right? We talk about dating, right? Um, and we tend to think of it as wanting to sort of win the affections of another person or to woo, right? Um, and courting, we don't really use, I guess, uh, in much of our uh, everyday uh, speak, but I think that we should, right? Because I think that it more accurately accommodates the type of involvement that we think to be involved with dating. I looked up courting, um, and courting, it kind of read, it said, look, to try to win the favor, preference, or goodwill, right? Um, to seek the affections of, to woo, to seek another's love, right? To woo. And I had become familiar with this word while writing Love, Reason, and Romantic Relationships, uh, which was my master's thesis. And I'll be pulling some information from that um, uh, because a very important distinction was pointed out to me, uh, I think by my friend, I think it might have been Brittany Hawkins at Michigan. Um, or, uh, she was like, well, yeah, you know, dating, uh, I let her read a draft of my thesis, and she was like, well, you know, when you're, when you're mentioning dating, um, that's kind of an ambiguous term because I like to say, you know, when I go out with my homegirls, like, we have, like, social dates, right? I mean, that's kind of ambiguous. You should probably, you know, uh, uh, sh do work there, try to strengthen that language a little bit. And I said, okay, well, I don't know what else I could say. So I went back and I found like, okay, well, courting, I guess, is more appropriate. Um, and when you look up dating, and this is why I think courting is more appropriate, you tend to get something like this, right? To go out socially on dates, to make a date with, go out on dates, right? And these are a couple of examples. She dated a lot during high school. Um, he'd been dating his best friend's sister, um, or whatever, right, brother, I guess. Um, but I mean, there's nothing in that term that, uh, specifically involves romantic involvement, right? Nothing about dating involves romantic involvement. Uh, and I got to thinking about that, and I said, well, yeah, well, damn, if, if, if dating doesn't have anything to do with romantic involvement, the way we sort of use dating is a little bit inappropriate, right? We sort of say that, oh, I'm dating her or I'm dating him, right? Sort of meaning what, we, what is more accurately um, captured by the term courting, right? Um, so today, I think um, that dating in our uh, contemporary society um, is what we would call talking to, right? Or he and I, I'm, I talk to him, girl, I don't, I'm not really, we're not an item, but we talk, you know what I'm saying? Like, um, so that's kind of what dating is more, uh, more akin to, I think. Um, and I'll kind of be using the two words interchangeably. That is courting, I mean, sorry, that is dating and talking, right? I'll be using those terms interchangeably. So I wanted to point to at an intention, right? And this is kind of like me wanting to do a sort of conceptual distinction, trying to do a little uh, uh, philosophical footwork, if you will, right? Um, 
phenomenologically, when I, when I think back on my past relationships and my involvement and stuff like that, right, when I think about this distinction between talking and courting, right, what I think about is there seems to be an intention present when I'm courting someone that isn't present when I'm, or that needed to be present when I'm dating someone, right? And what I have in mind is this. When I'm in, a, I think, a courting stage, and I think that this kind of captures uh, the phenomenon across a lot of different examples, um, but when I'm kind of like uh, courting someone, it's like, well, yeah, I'm intending for this to actually make manifest into a romantic relationship, a formalized romantic relationship. I know that about this girl, right? Um, maybe we've already hung out a little bit, right? And I'm like, yeah, no, now I really intend to try to be your boyfriend, right? But I don't think that that's always necessarily the case when we're talking to people, right? I feel like when we talk to people, right, we're wanting to sort of uh, weed out the field and see whether or not this person is worthy of even courting, right? But if, if they're worthy of even courting, right? So I'm wanting to say that, look, when we're dating, it's not immediately clear to me that we're uh, intending to uh, make manifest a formal relationship at the end of it, right? I mean, sometimes we do and sometimes we don't, right? But I, I just don't seem, it doesn't seem to me to be the case that that um, intention is present, right, when we're dating. So again, I've been using uh, talking and dating interchangeably, and I kind of wanted to uh, demonstrate this distinction. Um, and these two definitions, even if they're not completely accurate, right, they do give me uh, uh, some grounds to sort of try to make a conceptual distinction. Right? It does give me some ground to even try to make this conceptual distinction because two, we see here that these two terms um, might not be related to one another in the way we typically think that they are. So in my master's thesis, um, it's called Love, Reason, and Romantic Relationships. And the big, my bigger, I, my, I guess I don't know, I say my big idea, but the idea wasn't really that big. I mean, it's very, very uh, minuscule in the larger conversation of the philosophy of love. But um, I wanted to... My goal was to sort of draw a tighter uh, relationship, if you will, between love and reason, right? I think that too often in our culture and uh, just in our sort of dating practices, right, and courting practices, um, that we, we kind of uh, think that love and reason don't have anything to do with one another. I mean, think about how many times we sort of use love as an excuse for irrational behavior. Right? I mean, when you're cussing somebody out, hell, you threw his damn CDs out the truck window, right? It's, it's all crazy, but I love him. Um, so we seem to sort of want to use love as an excuse for irrational behavior in certain instances. I want to say, I want to say, look, love and reason aren't divorced from one another. They're actually related to one another, right? And so how are you going to do that, Justin? How do you, how do, you do that, right? Well, when I started thinking about romantic relationships, I say, well, it seems to me that we don't kind of just fall in love, right? We sort of select our partners, right? And uh, I got to think, well, damn, how do we select them? How do we select them? And as I got to thinking about it more, it became clearer to me that, well, when we, when we select our partners, we, it, it's because they have um, a certain set of qualities that we're responding to. Right? That, we're, that they have a certain set of qualities that we're responding to. Um, such as, that is to say, um, I want a girl that is, you know, funny. I want a girl that's witty, intellectual maybe, right? Um, I, she got to have a, you know, a good sense of humor, right? And these sort of abstract qualities that we sort of name, these are like things that we look for in potential partners. So I'll say, okay, well, then it must be something about love that uh, involves reason responsiveness, because I think that when we're in love, we sort of are responding to these sorts of reasons. Um, and how I developed that was with the help of Gabrielle Taylor. She says, if a, per if a person experiences this emotion, then it is possible for X to articulate, if only in a vague even if only in a vague sense, what the mo emotion is about. What the emotion is about, or the object of the emotion, is indicated in sentences of the form X flies Y, right? So Justin loves Sally, right? Or uh, uh, Justin is uh, scared of Sally or something, right? Um, so she thinks that love is one of these types of emotions right now, but before, at this point in her paper, she hasn't like laid that out. She's kind of looked, saying, well, look, there are emotions that admit to having at least this characteristic. Right? There are emotions that admit to at least having of this characteristic, right? So think of fear. Um, when I fear uh, the tiger, right? It's usually for some reason, maybe his sharp teeth or something like that. The next characteristic, she says, 
if X feels five, right? So if, if Justin feels love, right, or whatever, or let's, let's stick with fear for right now, because I, I don't want us to get confused. If X feels fear, right, and the tiger is the object of that emotion, if the tiger is, is the object of my fear, then I will believe that tiger, or that's why, right, to have a certain set of properties, or a particular property, depending upon what emotion is felt, uh, I will believe that that tiger is like harmful, or that uh, the tiger has done me a favor or a detriment, um, etc. Right. So I kind of have it here in formal terms, but basically the uh, the second characteristic is: look, if if this tiger is the object of my emotion, I can articulate what it is about that tiger that I'm, I guess, scared of. Right. Um, and it's the fact that I actually believe the tiger to have that quality. I'm not saying like, oh, I'm scared of the tiger's sharp teeth, and it's like a gummy tiger, right? Like he had like a bad dentist visit or something like that, and he got like all his teeth yanked, right? No fangs or whatever. But no, I don't have that guy in mind, right? He actually has to have this particular set of uh, uh, qualities. Or at least I have to believe him to have it, or her to have it, right? Lastly, she says, look, X will, or Justin will believe, and in most cases be able to articulate, that the tiger has the determinate qualities um, side, and he will believe further that it, he has a determinable, determinable quality um, because it has a determinate quality of side. That is to say, if X feels the emotion towards some object Y, then he believes Y to have some determinate quality uh, that would, he would normally be able to specify. So that's a lot of like crazy philosophical language. I'm just going to basically put it in, in regular terms. I would believe in most cases right, that Y has the determin determinate quality. So determinate quality for like, if, I'm, if the tiger is inducing in me fear, the determinate quality will be something like fearable or something like that, right? So if this person um, is, make, is if, if this person is the object of my love, right, he has the, or she has the determinate qualities of lovable, right? So, and whereas phi is like the love, and these are like lovable qualities, right? If this is the fear, these are the fearable qualities, right? So this is kind of Taylor's account. And uh, she kind of continues and she says, well, love seems to be an emotion like this. Fungibility, here's the problem, right? All I've said so far is, look, when we love, there's these qualities, right, that we love or whatever, but there's a problem. What if uh, I'm with Sally, because she's funny, and uh, you know, I don't know, she goes to one of Zach's comedy shows and just loses, it just changes her sense of humor completely, right? And I just no longer think she's funny anymore. Then. If love is my response to the qualities that she has, it should follow that I no longer love her because she's no longer funny. This is a problem because such a fickle attitude doesn't really seem like love, really, right? Love seems to sort of be able to withstand these sort of personality changes, these sort of quirks in our partners, right? So I'm going to read the problem more formally. If Jane's qualities are what justify my loving her, then that justification lapses as soon as she loses those qualities. Insofar as my love is responsive to its reasons, therefore, it too ought to lapse as soon as she loses those qualities. And such a fickle attitude hardly seems like love. So if this is my account, right, it's, it's completely uh, akin to that of uh, Taylor, then I, I also have this problem. And, uh, <laughs> right? I certainly wouldn't want this to be the case uh, with my account. So how do I handle this objection, right? How, does, how do you handle this objection? Kalani says a couple of things that I think can be helpful to us, right? Um, that help us get around the problem of fungibility, right? Kalani says that love is a final valuation of a relationship from the perspective of a participant in that relationship and the non-final, non-instrumental value of one's beloved, right? So what you'll see immediately is that, you know, the language of valuation is still there, right? I've said that, look, when we, when we love, we value the qualities that our partner has, right? So the value piece is still intact. But Kalani says instead of qualities, we value the relationship itself, right, that we have with our partners, right? Or our family members, or our cousins, or whatever, right? And I thought that this was genius. I said, oh, that sounds right, right? Now, final value is something that is like uh, intrinsic value, but it's, it's, it's not necessarily intrinsic value. 
How Kalaitney sort of uh, articulates what he means by a uh, final valuation is just this. Um, the easiest way I think for me to say it is that something shows up as intrinsically valuable, right, from the perspective of that person. The example that I would like to use is a dentist, right? So if there were no bad teeth, the work of the dentist would not be valuable. <coughs> Clearly his work is extrinsically valuable, right? But for the dentist himself, his work might provide him with the reasons for continuing his work, right? It's not like, like why, if we were to ask him, why are you a dentist? He would say, well, because I love dentistry or something like that, right? It is dentistry itself uh, that I find valuable, right? So it shows up to him as intrinsic value, right? But I guess in a larger or a broader metaphysical scheme, it, it's not necessarily intrinsic value because, again, if there were no bad teeth, like we wouldn't really need this dude. Um, so, of course, if we, he's going to say, well, you know, relationships are, I mean, if uh, love is the valuing of a relationship, we had better hope he has something prepared to say uh, what relationships are. Kalani says that relationships are historical, ongoing, and with particular people. Great, we brought love and reason together, right? Because, um, you know, we, it's grounded by these reasons, right, that this person has, and it's grounded by uh, our relationship, right? These are the things that are providing me with reasons. And that's good, because Kalani's account helps us get around fungibility. However, Kalani's relationship account does not tell us all that we would reasonably expect it to. It does not explain how valuing our relationships in the right kind of way um, relates to our action in loving relationships, particularly how this valuing explains our acting in accordance with some obligations that we have to our loved ones, right? I thought that this was a problem with Kaladi's account. <laughs> oh boy, right? And why this is a problem is because as I began reflecting more on relationships, I say, well, there's patterns of action, I think, that are appropriate to certain relationships, right? It seems to be the case that we have obligations to the people that we love. For instance, consider an instance where you may be watching a football game on a Saturday or a Sunday, um, and your mom's like, hey, go take out the trash, right? Sometimes you don't want to go take out the trash, but you will still go take out the trash because you feel as if you ought to or that you should do that, right? That's the sort of feeling of obligation. And it didn't seem like what Kalani had to say in at least uh, Love is Value in a Relationship translated to action. We, we value you know, the, our people in this kind of way, we value our relationships in this kind of way, but how does that dictate to us patterns of action right, that are appropriate to a particular relationship? To say that relationships are contractual, right? Relationships, um, they're contractual. 